welcome everybody back into Nerd Sesh. As always, I'm Carson Reber and alongside me is Logan Camden. And today we are doing our full NBA playoff preview. We have been chipping away, going in-depth series by series over the last couple episodes. So if you watch our intensive breakdowns on half of the NBA first round playoff series, you can find those as individual clips on our YouTube page or just within the last couple of episodes we've done today. We are going to go in-depth on the two remaining first-round series that are set in stone that we haven't gone in-depth on, that being Lakers-Nuggets and Sixers-Knicks, two very fun, interesting series. But we are also going to just talk our way through the entire Nerd Sesh playoff sim. We'll go through some of the theoretical matchups down the line, and we'll hit on basically the key points why we're making our picks for the series that we've gone super in-depth in already, but we won't go quite as in-depth on this episode, because if you want that, you can watch those clips that are already out there. So, with that, Logan, we will start in the West, and we'll start with the only series matchup that we don't have set in stone, which is the 1-8, because we still have those final playing games remaining. That will be OKC against either the Kings, down Malik Monk and Kevin Herter, or the Pelicans, seemingly down Zion Williamson. So uh, what's just your quick gut feeling on OKC matching up with either of those teams? I think it's probably going to be Sacramento if New Orleans is without uh, Zion Williamson. And... Well, they are without Zion for this game. It would be a question maybe if he could return for the first round, but nothing I... looks good. I heard, yeah, I heard yesterday they were projecting him to be out two weeks, so it's pretty unlikely yeah. that he would be available for the first round. So considering that, uh, I think the Thunder win uh, in six. I think the Thunder, in a hypothetical against the Kings, I think they out-Kings the Kings. And what I mean by that is it's two really high-powered offenses going at each other. Uh, I am concerned about the specific matchup of Chet Holmgren versus DeMontis Sabonis on the low block. I think it's a bad matchup for him considering just how – you know, physically strong and imposing Sabonis is, but OKC plays hard defensively like Sacramento, and I think they have the more high-powered, uh, up-tempo, easy offensive formula. So uh, I think it'll be a good series. Again, I think Sabonis and Alex Len, uh, yeah, yes, Alex Len versus Chet Holmgren, they provide size issues enough to steal a couple mm -hmm. games, but uh, I just think OKC is the better team with the better superstars, so give me them. So I would also expect Sacramento to get through because Zion is out, but I would confidently take OKC in this series. Sacramento has given them some trouble. Like they played very competitive games this regular season and the physicality is one dimension of it, specifically with Domas. Like he is as physical a basketball player as there is and OKC is as slight a basketball team as there is. And particularly, they're a weak rebounding team, and he has been the most effective rebounder in basketball this year. And across those matchups, averaged four and a half offensive rebounds a game. At the same time, they do a pretty good job of harassing and pestering him by really playing that collective team defense where they have all of these athletes who are engaged and are swarming him. So it's not like Domas eats them alive, although physically he does have a clear advantage. And OKC is just the better team, especially with the absence of Malik, who I do think, shout out Keon Ellis, shout out Keegan Murray, how they can step up as spot-up shooters, but the dribble penetration, the playmaking you get from Malik, they just can't supplement with this roster. They have really good point-of-attack defenders to throw it at De'Aaron Fox. They have the best dude on the floor in SGA. I would probably take them in five, maybe six. And then against New Orleans, I would probably just take OKC in five again. That would be a fun matchup to see the small ball on small ball dynamics because I think we'd see a lot of Larry Nance at the five and then we would have these two teams with a bunch of athletic and hyper switchable wings and it would kind of be futuristic basketball but without Zion I just don't think New Orleans has the offensive pop and the physical advantage necessary like he is a problem for OKC but it just doesn't look like he's going to play and so I don't think that they ultimately have the juice needed to pull off the upset so OKC pretty good draw for them either way in my opinion I expect them to move on as do you now let's talk Nuggets Lakers and we will go in depth with this one because we haven't touched on this matchup and it is an interesting one. It is obviously a rematch of the Western Conference Finals. What's the first key that stands out to you here, Logan? I mean, we're going to go pretty in depth uh, with this one, but I think it's a really simple uh, formula. You know, I don't think it's if the Lakers lose, I think it's when the Lakers lose. Uh, I think it comes down to a, a few key factors. I think one is how much LeBron consistently exerts himself in this series. And mm. I kind of expect a LeBron back against the wall, like 
trapped animal kind of feel. Like, it's basically all or nothing for the Lakers in this series. Like, they know that if they knock off the Nuggets here in this first round, that it's it's not smooth sailing by any means. Like, the West is very, very talented. But, you know, if they slay the Dragon here, the path gets only easier, right? You got the hard part out of the way. And so... I do think we're going to see the Lakers exert themselves in a way that we haven't. I think LeBron is going to have to impose himself. And if he doesn't, this series is going to be over in the blink of an eye. I think it is LeBron methodically hunting every possession down the floor. That is getting a switch on to KCP. That is getting a switch on to Jamal Murray. That is attacking those guys. That is, you know, and I'm talking about like full bore. Like LeBron can't be kicking out early in the shot clock. He's got to create real advantages. He's got to take them to the rack. He has got to just use his physical advantages uh, on mismatches against Denver. Those are really the only two guys that I think he's going to be attack, uh, be able to really attack down the floor. I mean, the Nuggets are just big. Like, if it's a Gordon switch, if it's an MPJ switch, if it's a Jokic switch, LeBron doesn't have any advantages there. Then the second thing for the Lakers is how much Anthony Davis impacts the game offensively. Jokic is a bad matchup for him, man. Anthony Davis is one of these brute force guys that just uses his strength, and Jokic is a really good deterrent for him. Uh, How consistent is Anthony Davis going to be? If he is 20 to 25 plus efficiently every night, guess what? The Lakers can prolong this series. If AD is 20, and then 13, and then 26, and then 12, this could be very quick. You know, and AD's prone to having these uh, mishaps here on the low block. LeBron and AD always give the Lakers such a high baseline for offense because they're physically imposing guys that get downhill, that constantly create rim pressure and penetration, and so they're going to draw a lot of free throws, they're going to take a lot of shots at the rim, and it gives them a good baseline. But it is really about how much Anthony Davis is hidden on those shots and how, you know, how much LeBron really wants to push himself. The next key is D'Angelo Russell and Austin Reeves shots falling as Roy Hachimura. Spot-up shooting is going to be huge for the Lakers in this series. And how much those guys are on is going to determine how long the series go. And like I said, I'm anticipating a better series than last year, Carson. I think the Lakers have a massive, massive chip on their shoulders. I think LeBron is peeved that they went out sad last season. Uh, It may have been the greatest sweep ever, but it was a sweep. So I think this Lakers team is going to fight really hard. Um, we don't know how many more years of LeBron we have left. We don't know how many more years of this window we have left. And so they're going to have to fight. We already saw one, you know, kind of dynasty fall by the wayside in the Warriors. Like, it looks like the end of an era. And I'm not, you know, closing the door on the Lakers, but there's not that many more opportunities, man. That window is closing fast. And so they understand the gravity of the situation, the importance of this series. I think they are out for vengeance. I think they've got a vendetta against his team. But like I said, man, I don't think it's I don't think it's if. I think it's when. Uh, I don't really. I mean, you tweeted this out before we did the show, Carson. I'm trying to come up ways for the Lakers to slow down the Nuggets. I yeah. don't know, man. I, I don't think the Lakers have a path to winning this series, barring a Denver Nuggets injury. And so, depending on these factors that I listed off. Maybe they can push it to six games. If all things go right, maybe they can push it to seven, man. I see maxed out Lakers effort, maxed out AD, maxed out LeBron, maxed out guys around them. Lakers push the Nuggets to six, losing a good series. I do expect it to be a more competitive series than last year, and it was very competitive for a sweep. Like, the Nuggets were clearly the better team, but the Lakers were pretty much in every game. Game one is when they went down big early, but even that one they made interesting in the second half. Jokic just came out and said it was their toughest series last year. So, it wasn't like your conventional sweep, and also, this year, the Lakers clearly are so, so much better than their seeding. That goes without saying it should i know there have been a lot of people saying oh why are you treating a play-in team with this sort of respect and it's because the ceiling they've shown when they're engaged has been super impressive since february 1st home stretch of the season when they've dialed in they're 24 and 10 and the big difference to me between this team and last year's team is the level that they're playing at offensively. They are clicking on all cylinders there in a way that we really haven't even seen in this LeBron AD Lakers era. They're just a better offense than they were last year. Since February 1st, they're third in offensive rating, and there are several key players who are just clearly playing at a much higher level offensively. LeBron was 
dealing with the foot injury last year in the playoffs, and he was also just clanging every jumper, right? It was really the worst three-point shooting stretch we've seen from him in a long time. He was 26% from deep in the playoffs. This has been the best three-point shooting season of his career, and he has consistently been lethal off the catch, 41% from deep overall this year. So that alone is a very different dynamic. That just makes him a significantly more effective basketball player because he's always going to hunt his mismatches and kill you in transition and play his bully ball when he is also an elite spot-up shooter who you can't help off of when he's this good as a pull-up shooter, which helps his isolation game when he doesn't want to, like, fully assert himself physically every possession because he just can't really bear that responsibility night after night after night at 39 years old. That's when LeBron is damn near a perfect offensive player. He doesn't have any weaknesses, and that's who he's been this year, especially post-All-Star break. He's been ridiculous, over 27-9 and nine on 67% true shooting. So he is a much better player than he was at this point last year. D'Angelo Russell was unplayably awful versus the Nuggets. They did still play him. They shouldn't have been. He was the worst version of himself that he can be, taking bad shots, taking the offense out of rhythm, missing every single one of them. He has been pretty exceptional offensively this year. Elite as a pure shooter, pulling up, very dangerous there, good playmaker, and just a really good option to float the offense and to complement LeBron as he continues to become a more and more valuable off-ball player. So they have a pretty great combination of that interior physical dominance that you get from aggressive LeBron and AD with really good shooting because Austin Reeves was great in the playoffs, but he has continued to play at a really high level. Elite shooter, Rui Hachimura, we know, is an elite spot-up shooter, also a really physical, good mismatch attacker, smart cutter. And when LeBron is playing like a borderline top five player, they have that sort of elite offensive engine who can carry you through these games. And he is going to hunt his go-to actions, Logan, as you mentioned. They're going to invert that pick and roll and say, all right, let's see if we can get an open three for Austin Reeves. You hedge, you're a little bit late to recover. He's an incredible shooter in those situations, or you switch it and LeBron can go to work and play his bully ball. I also think using him as a screener was very effective and something that in the last regular season meeting between these two teams, the Lakers went to in crunch time several times and they were very successful with it. He's just such a an explosive downhill force still, especially when he doesn't have to create that first step with pure quickness, right? You get him rolling downhill with a head of steam. That's a challenge for Jokic to stop. So I think this is a better Lakers offense by a good bit. And I think that that gives them the sort of upside that they need to steal a game or two where last year it always felt like the Nuggets were going to out-execute them offensively and they just had much more reliable avenues there. The Nuggets offense is still definitely better and I do not think the Lakers have answers for it and we'll get to that in a little bit. But the offensive ceiling LA has this year is a lot higher. The other key dynamic is that AD just got punked last year, like absolutely punked, embarrassed. It was such a switch in the discourse between, oh my God, AD is having like the best defensive run that we've seen from any defender this century in the playoffs to yikes, AD alternating days, not a top 10 player, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And really that was because of his offensive inconsistency. Jokic got whatever he wanted. I don't even put that on AD, bro. That's just like the best offensive player ever doing what he does but four of 15 in game two six of 15 in game four that sort of offensive inconsistency is unacceptable from ad and Jokic is a tough matchup for him in a couple of ways because he's so long he's so huge ad is certainly not going to bully him he's got great hands and you saw him affect ad on face-ups and cuts and whatnot rolls just poking the ball out of his hands so he's definitely not the worst defensive matchup, especially because AD isn't the sort of consistent, explosive, over-the-top lob thread that he used to be. He still has an advantage there, but for the most part, he's going to try to beat you with his skilled shot making. And he has to be aggressive, I think, and that touch shot making has to be on. And if it is, he can absolutely play better than last year. So there are several components that make me think this Lakers team can make this a more competitive series than last year. D'Lo playing better, LeBron playing better, AD with clear potential to play better just because he can't really play much worse than he did in this series last year. But uh, the real, real, real problem for the Lakers that I'm not sure there's any solving is what the hell they do with this Denver offense. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's an answer. You know, everybody after 
what was it the first game or the first half last year when they put Hachimura on it was the uh, second on, half of the first game yeah yeah they put Hachimura on Jokic and uh, AD is help side oh they solved Jokic they solved it Lakers are gonna go win the title yeah um I don't think there's an answer and that really is the key component for me I do think the Lakers have a higher offensive ceiling uh, they're just better than last year. And I also think it's, a, like you said, man, it's a LeBron Hill thing. Uh, D'Angelo Russell is playing so much better basketball. And I really like this starting five. I think physically, I think they match up pretty well just in terms of size. And that's a, you know, a box mm-hmm. you have to check against Denver. Uh, Denver's really big. Aaron Gordon, Jokic, Michael Porter Jr., you know, KCP and Jamal Murray. They're not small guards either. Like physically, the Lakers match up really well against his team and i think the thing that really could turn the tide in the favor of la for me carson was if they had like three guys off the bench that i really really liked um you know i don't love gabe vincent i don't love jackson hayes i don't love uh tarian prince if those guys were impactful maybe it would be enough to swing the series but uh no, I don't think that they're going to be able to slow down Denver. And that's been the key advantage. Denver has been one of the best teams in in the clutch all year long. Like, I believe, uh, like, record-wise, offensive rating, defensive rating, net rating, like, Denver is a top, like, a top five team across the board in terms of clutch, uh, yeah, clutch yeah. rating. They're number one in clutch net rating. It's plus 24 and a half. And so that, for me, is, like, the biggest component. We've just seen it too many times where... And I hate doing this, man. I hate, I hate always going back to this comparison, this inevitability. But Nikola Jokic, with the ball in his hands in a close game on offense, is like Patrick Mahomes with time on the clock in football. There's just this inevitable feeling where it's like, damn it, man, we did it again. <laughs> like, the Bills leave Mahomes 13 seconds. You leave Jokic 10 seconds in a two-point, one-point game, it's like, damn, man. You know, we we almost had him. He was right in our clutches, mm-hmm. and he just, you know, you know, it's like that old, uh, what was that old commercial with the guy with the fishing rod? I think it was Geico. You got to be quicker than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got you got to be quicker than that, man. And, yeah, I just, I, I don't, I have nothing to say on this on this show about what the Lakers could do to slow them down. I don't know what you could do. Jokic is going to, if you double Jokic and you trap him and you blitz him, guess what? Jokic has eyes in the back of his head. He's going to find that open shooter that you left. If it's in the corner, if it's on the wing, if it's the top of the key. And if not, that guy's going to cut to the bucket and Jokic is going to find him. Like, they're just maybe the best offense I've ever seen. And I don't know how you slow it down. And they've shown me too many times against basically everybody that, they're going to find the guy, man. They're going to generate the shot. If it's a two-man game in these scenarios where it's Jokic and Murray, basically what I'm saying is, is that I guess, man, the Lakers would just really, really have to dominate non-Jokic minutes, like really convincingly win non-Jokic minutes to make this a really competitive series, in my opinion. And I don't trust their bench unit enough to really buy into the fact that they could do that. I mean, that, that's my take, man. I don't really think that you can stop the Nuggets offense uh, yeah. bar, barring an injury barring them dominating non-Jokic minutes I don't really see a path to LA slowing Denver down at all I don't see that path either and that's why even though I think the Lakers are playing significantly better offensively ultimately they still to me don't have a reasonable chance to win this series just because they're not going to get enough stops and first of all Jamal Murray is a bad matchup for them. He has historically played them very well. <laughs> I just thought you were going to say Jamal Murray is a bad man. You know what, dude? I'm going to say that as well. Jamal Murray is a bad man. And we know that when it comes to these stages, like having a guy who is that special, a pure shot maker who just delivers in the moment is so valuable. In this series last year, gave the Lakers 32 a night on 65% true shooting. And what's very noteworthy is he did that facing... 31 minutes a game of Dennis Schroeder. Jared Vanderbilt was playing early in that series, played only 40 total minutes before he was basically unplayable because of his offense. But, like, those are real quality point-of-attack defenders. Those are hounds. This year, the Lakers' best point-of-attack option is going to be Gabe Vincent, who I do think is a good defender, but certainly doesn't have 
the size and length to pester him like Evando does. Also, I just think there's a quickness with Schroeder. There's a, a just consistent ball pressure. His motor doesn't stop. And also, he's a little bit longer. Vincent has a positive wingspan too, but Schroeder has like a 6'8 wingspan. So I don't think Vincent is as good of an option as either of those guys. He's also just like working his way into playing again. And he played well in the play-in game, but he's also like obviously the third guard here it's not like they're gonna play him more than D'Lo or Reeves in my opinion as they did with Schroeder where Schroeder was playing significantly more than D'Lo I don't really see that outcome this year and Vincent guarded Murray reasonably well in the finals but Miami was at their best there when they had like a bigger wing on him a Jimmy Butler I think even Caleb Martin defended Jamal better because Gabe Vincent just isn't big enough to really make him uncomfortable in those matchups. So when they last played in the regular season, Cam Reddish was the guy who they primarily put on Jamal Murray. And I do think Cam Reddish has good tools, but Cam Reddish is out of the rotation right now. And do you trust him offensively as a shot maker and just as like a decision maker to be on the floor playing big playoff minutes? Maybe they try it for a little bit, but I don't think that he's the guy who you turn to as the answer. So just in terms of that point of attack matchup with Jamal, I think they fare worse last year. And I don't think that they're very well equipped to handle him. And then the Jokic matchup makes guarding Jamal all that much harder. Obviously dealing with Jokic on his own is like this gargantuan task. Good luck. You're just going to fail. But there are specific things that he does in this matchup that create huge advantages for Jamal Murray. One of those things being that in stretches... The Lakers will try Rui Hachimura on Jokic in this series. That was the thing that in the second half of game one, like legitimately turned that game around because AD was doing such an awesome job as a helper. He was affecting Jokic's shots out of the post. He was affecting all of those interior passes to Aaron Gordon and it swung that game. But I do think that a significant part of that was just the competitive advantage of it being a different look. And now that Jokic shot for a couple games in that series. That was the primary strategy when they last played in the regular season. Rui was on him for most of the game. They just ate those looks up alive, man. And I think that there's several reasons for that. First of all, Rui just isn't quite big enough to legitimately hold up as the primary post defender against Jokic. The one team that can really implement that strategy of we are going to have our best interior defender as the roamer, as the guy who can help onto Jokic, and then we're going to leave somebody else as the primary post defender is the Timberwolves because Cat is not an NBA 4. Cat is a 5 who is playing the 4, right? The guy is massive. Rui is just conceding too much size and strength. And so Jokic can just make those touch shots over the top of him too easily. He doesn't affect those passes to cutters because he's just too small. And the Nuggets have figured out too many ways to avoid AD entirely in those actions because he will make a couple plays where he comes over as a helper and he blows things up. But when you use Aaron Gordon as a spacer, well, AD is probably going to stay honest and at, at that point, he's not as much of a factor as a helper. Or Jokic did an awesome job of his signature fake hook shot into the lob to Aaron Gordon where AD converges on the help and then boom, that's an automatic look for AG when he's a cutter. So I just think they've kind of solved that. And also the biggest problem arguably is what it does for the Murray Jokic pick and roll. Because when you have Rui Hachimura guarding those actions, instead of Anthony Davis, everything's a little bit different, right? Rui Hachimura in drop is a little bit different than Anthony Davis. And so Jamal just gets these beautiful, beautiful pull-up looks out of those actions. So I do believe the Lakers have to keep AD on Jokic for the vast majority of this series. I just think, leave your best player on him. At least AD has the size and length to force Jokic into some tougher shots than Rui will. Like, AD cannot stop Jokic. Nobody can stop Jokic. We have seen that decisively at this point. I legitimately think he's the best offensive player ever. But put your best defender on the planet on him in single coverage. Don't leave the option for the Nuggets to like scheme ways to avoid your best defensive player this also presents some interesting dynamics though because at the end of that last game they did put AD on Jokic finally and then they were switching the Jokic Murray pick and roll that gave Jokic these huge mismatches where now he has Austin Reeves switched on to him like AD can hold up well against Jamal Murray but the problem is now well if Murray misses a pull up three a step back three guess who gets the offensive board it's Jokic if he throws that entry pass or that pocket pass Jokic now has a huge size advantage so 
I think what they probably have to do is sit Anthony Davis in drop, have him active in that drop, right? But as crazy as it sounds, and this is the problem, this is why this Nuggets offense, and specifically this two-man game, is so ridiculously good, I think they have to make Jamal Murray beat them with his pull-up shooting by basically conceding those looks because there just isn't a good answer. You certainly cannot trap. I've seen some Lakers fans. Why do we never double Jamal Murray? You don't give Jokic a four on three. That's why. I don't even think AD can necessarily start the series playing at the level of the screen, hedging hard because then you're conceding those pocket passes. You're letting Jokic get to his 65% floaters or pick you apart with the four on three with the shooting around him and Aaron Gordon in the dunker spot. I just think you have to hope that Jamal is missing his pull-up jumpers. And that's why there's no good answer. That's why I do not envy Darvin Ham because I just don't think you're taking this Nuggets offense away. I personally believe that Jamal Murray is going to make those pull-up jumpers at a very good clip. And if he is just absolutely murdering you like that, that's when I think you have to be willing to switch to AD playing at the level of the screen. And he affects those pocket passes better than anybody else. So maybe he can get some hands on those, but giving Jokic that sort of runway and that sort of advantage is just really really scary to me so that's the bottom line every defensive configuration that i consider the nuggets are getting great offense and that's what they do that's why they are one of the best offenses ever they leave you without answers jamal is too damn good as a pull-up shooter Jokic is too damn good at everything too damn good a pick and pop shooter too damn good a touch shot maker too damn good a passer too damn big too damn strong and so that's where I just struggle to see LA winning this series. It's not about them generating offense. It's about them getting stops. And you mentioned the clutch factor. LA has been a good clutch team, but nobody is better in the clutch than the Nuggets. And when they get to those bread and butter actions, nothing is more unstoppable than Murray Jokic pick and roll, especially if you have Aaron Gordon in the dunker spot, right? And if you are playing like a hard hedge look and then Jokic can throw up those lob passes to AG, their process is just so refined. They're so dialed in all the time. They're just a machine. They don't go through these sloppy stretches when it comes to playoff basketball like other people do. Their floor is so damn high. And when it comes down to winning time, when these games get close, they just grind out these wins better than anybody else because they create better shots than anybody else. And they have the best player on the floor by a large margin who you just cannot take away. I bet on that being successful. This Lakers team is scary. They are not as good as the Denver Nuggets. And even like, I think the big key thing that you also hit on too, dude, is even when they're not hitting those shots or creating those looks, like they're creating advantages. Like when you talk about if you double Murray out of that and you concede the backside, then they've got a rebound. Like there really is nothing... I don't know. I There's, there's nothing you can do. I mean, Murray and Jokic is... One of the greatest pick and roll and two man actions in in basketball, like ever, man. It is just yeah. It's like you said, dude. You're just sitting there crossing your fingers, going, "All right, man. Well, I hope Jamal has a clunker today. Maybe we can win." And yeah. it's like, am I going to bank on Jamal Murray having four clunkers of games in a single series? No, no. I'm just not. Um, I don't. Yeah, I, I wish I could come on here and tell Lakers fans that there's a there's a way, man. That there's a there's a how. And I, I just don't, man. I, I just, I, I really don't. I don't think there's a solution. I don't think there's a way that I can see this happening, man. Barring something unexpected happening, I think the Nuggets just handle business. I agree. How much do you think Gabe Vincent plays in this series? Do you see a world where D'Lo is off by enough? Mm. Or it could be Austin Reeves as well, but I think he's the more competitive defender. I think he just has the better feel. He'll impact the game more if he's not knocking D'Lo's... down his shots. Because I'm just thinking 16. the point of attack defense without Gabe Vincent out there is a just flagrant problem. And... I don't even love it with Gabe Vincent, but without him, like Jamal's going to eat. I'd say 16 to 20 a night. I really don't see Reeves or D'Lo being off. D'Lo's shot, man, has just been yeah. so butter. Like, there was this one play the other night. Uh, he, like, drives to the right elbow. Pump fakes. Never leaves his feet. Gets a defender to jump. And, like, he never leaves his feet and just, like, hits. His jumper has been so wet this season. Oh, yeah. I wanted to ask you, like, I think Gabe probably plays 16 to 20. I think that's about the range you can give him. You want to give him enough burn. And he's a... 
good enough like spot up and pull up shooter where if he's left open like he's absolutely. gonna hit it um absolutely good you, shooter. you know if you want to give him a screen you know he was stepping into a lot of he's a good step into his shot three-point shooter like uh last year when the knicks were leaving him and letting you know miami set those screens up top he was killing them uh does vando change the complexion of the series at all if he was available well, he's the best point of attack answer, but I just think probably you're bleeding too much value offensively. So uh, I think at the end of the day, like the Lakers formula here would probably have to be unconscious shooting, unstoppable LeBron, super aggressive AD. And that's where I agree. I think D'Lo and Reeves are both going to play like 30 plus minutes. I think that Vincent will be the guy who plays the most off the bench in this series, but I just think the value that they bring as shot creators and shot makers is so significant. And I don't like their formula to getting stops in this series whatsoever. Like I said, if your best answer is let's concede pull-up looks to Jamal Murray, who shoots 43% on pull-up threes and 47% from mid-range, that's really tough, man. And that's what the Nuggets do to you. So I think it's a more competitive series than last year. The Nuggets offense, though, is just legitimately unstoppable, and I don't think that changes in this matchup. I'm going to take them in six. I would put the over under at five and a half. I'm going to give credit to that Lakers offense and say it goes six, even though the Nuggets have swept the uh, last seven, right? Four last year and three this year in the regular season. How many games do you see this going? I took Nuggets in six. Yeah. The Lakers are really good, man. I'm not trying to discredit the Lakers at all. In fact, we have been the guys pushing, hey, the Lakers are like a legit threat in the West for a while. They were number five in my contender rankings. They were number four in your contender rankings a couple weeks ago. But this is the matchup. This is the matchup where it's just like, boy, you are fighting a real, real uphill battle. So, all right, let's move on. We already talked about this series, but now we're into the 3-6 out West. T-Wolves, Suns, what are the keys to your pick here? Uh, I took Timberwolves in seven. Uh, I think Ant gets downhill and performs like a superstar. I think Ant has to check that box in this series. I also think Carl Anthony Towns has to pull his weight if either of those guys are off. Timberwolves probably don't get this done. They just don't have enough uh, offensive pop around them. Uh, I think Anthony Edwards has to weaponize himself as a playmaker. Like I don't think there's anybody on Phoenix that can really hold Ant. He's just too explosive. And so if he makes a effort to consistently get downhill to get shots at the rim to draw fouls to play make for his teammates and collapse the defense i think minnesota can generate a really high shot quality again around him guys have to shoot well and then on the other side minnesota has to disrupt phoenix but i think they're equipped to do so with their formula and i just like i like minnesota's formula more winning defensively getting out in transition slowing and grinding the game down uh getting out in transition and slowing and grinding the game down i would say it's the latter they're not gonna get out and run very much but they're gonna win defensively i think they're gonna get some easy buckets out in transition i I like minnesota's formula a little more and then i'm just kind of stained by phoenix's regular season phoenix was by far the worst fourth quarter team in basketball like worst clutch off or worst fourth quarter offensive rating uh, bottom five in terms of fourth quarter defensive rating and net rating. Second to last in turnover percentage in the fourth quarter. They were a bad clutch team. I don't know. I just, I think the Suns have issues, and I think it's a growing pains thing. It took Minnesota an entire year to figure out their lineup construction and really start playing well. It took L.A., um, you know, a while to figure out their roster construction. I think it's just a... I think it's a continuity thing. I think it's going to take the Suns another full year of playing together with this crop of talent. And if they switch up the role players, I think that's really insignificant. I think it's Beal, Book, and KD really figuring out how this thing gels, how this thing works. I think it takes another year before the Suns are real contenders and and really figure it out to me. These things take time. And so I think the Suns do figure it out. I don't think it's in this playoff series. The Suns do scare me. That's why I'm taking this in seven. But I like Minnesota's identity. I like their formula. And I think Ant performs well on the biggest stage. So give me the T-Wolves in seven. I'm super conflicted about this series, dude. Might be the toughest to pick. Might also be the most interesting just because of how dramatically different the styles are between these two teams. I think it comes down to a few things. Number one, can Carl Anthony Towns consistently punish the Suns for being a small team that is really prioritized offensive skill and they just don't have anybody who can guard him 
can he punish them enough for that? And at the same time, can he stay on the floor defensively? Because they are going to make him guard in space more than just about anybody else. He is going to be targeted with guard on guard screens. He's going to have to guard lethal spot up shooters. And uh, ultimately his ability to stay, hang in defensively, and then just like give them back more than he is giving up is going to be key. I also think can Phoenix stay in front of Ant? Because I don't really like their point of attack options dealing with him. And then can he hold up at the level of a legit offensive number one that they need him to? Is he going to pressure the rim that consistently? Will he make enough of his pull-up jumpers? Can he play make effectively enough? Because they're going to make him beat them with his passing. I also think Gobert has an opportunity here to basically punish Phoenix as a vertical threat, just with his size on the interior as well, going over the top when Ant is pressuring the rim, out of pick and roll as a lob threat, when Nurk isn't on the floor and he is bullying whoever the hell is at the five. That's where Minnesota is going to win this series. This is a team that hangs their hat on being an awesome defense, but in this specific matchup, you're playing an absurdly skilled offense. You're playing Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, Bradley Beal, a 46% three-point shooter in Grayson Allen. That's just in the starting five. Like, they have weapons. What you have is being way bigger and way stronger. And uh, the ability to weaponize those physical advantages is ultimately going to be key to them. Because Phoenix is going to get theirs, even against this defense. They're just so damn good in terms of shot making. But they are poorly equipped to guard this Minnesota team. And so I'm betting on that bully ball winning out just enough i'm taking minnesota in seven but i'm very scared by the potential realities that what if ant is just like off in terms of his pull-up jumpers he's not consistently super efficient there what if his decision making is poor what if you get bad cat who isn't being consistently aggressive offensively or he's turning the ball over too much and uh, defensively he's really struggling like there are kind of more worlds in which i see things going really south for Minnesota just because I worry about their half-court offense, but I really think this is an opportunity for them to produce offensively in a way that like they couldn't in any other matchup basically out West because uh, Phoenix's defense is so average and particularly not built for a huge team and a just super athletic guy like Ant. So I'm taking Minnesota there, but it's a very, very tough one. Okay, Dallas Clippers, Logan, what's your pick? I'm taking the Mavericks in six. Uh, I think Luka Doncic is going to be the best player on the court in this series. I really trust Dallas's defense. Uh, even against, this is a tough matchup too. Like the Clippers have offensive pop, man. Kawhi, PG, um, Norman Powell, Russell Westbrook, Terrence Mann is the guard rotation. How long can he go bench. without naming James Harden? Uh, they he got didn't James do Harden. It. I think James Harden <laughs> is. Uh, Going to put up a dud in this series. I think he's been really bad post-All-Star break the second half of this season. I'm anticipating that to continue. Uh, I have said this before. I'll say it again. I think the Clippers' key to this series is when they bench James Harden and how the guy they choose to replace him performs in his spot. Um, Harden can set this team up, but he's like so limited as a scorer. has no burst off the dribble. I just think James Harden would really need to pull his weight in this series for them to get it done, and that's why I think the Mavericks ultimately have an easier avenue to consistent offense. They have Luka Doncic. They have Kyrie Irving. I think that the high pick-and-roll attack with Luka from 30 feet out is just going to cause nightmares for this defense again. Dragging Zoo or dragging whoever they have out all the way out there, it leaves any defense susceptible to an easy lob over the top for Gafford or Lively for Luka to hit a shot in the mid-range, for him to get all the way to the rack, for him to get to a step back three. Like, I just think the Mavericks offense is going to keep coming, keep humming, and I think their defense can slow down the Clippers enough. So give me the Mavericks in six. I'm taking the Mavs in six as well, and it comes down to, first of all, this team has been playing much, much better as of late. It's just like every Clippers red flag, Kawhi health, hard and sucking them falling off defensively which i think is mostly an effort thing in the home stretch of the regular season but all of that bad stuff has come to the surface after they were playing at such an incredibly high level and dallas just has a rare rare combination of shot creation right now with this backcourt like all-time special luca is one of those overwhelming offensive forces that i just don't think you can take away I legitimately think LA is probably at their best doing a lot of heavy trapping and blitzing here just to get the ball out of his hands and force Dallas's spot up shooting to beat them. But I think Luka's going to dominate the series offensively 
pretty much no matter what. Kyrie is playing at a ridiculous level. The Mavs have been defending much better as of late. And I'm just left with more question marks about the Clippers. James Harden, Kawhi's health. I'm going to take the team that has been surging and that has a really good playoff formula because I also think good wing defenders, really good rim protector, really good rim protector, rebounding better, more athletic in the front court as of late. I really like this Dallas team and I'm going to pick them to beat LA as well. The 82 game preseason is in the books and it's finally time for the real season. Don't miss out on any of the NBA playoff action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. From the play-in tournament through the finals, DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered with same game parlays, live betting, odds boosts, and so much more. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code NERDS. New customers bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's code NERDS only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Celtics are going to get either the Heat or the Bulls, who of course we both saw in play in action last night. Shout out Kobe White getting 42. Unfortunately, Jimmy Butler is hurt and now there's conflicting reporting on if we already know what the injury is. If it's an MCL thing, Sham says that he was going to be out multiple weeks. There's a Heat reporter who says that is not official yet. Either way, it doesn't look good for Jimmy. He finished this game, but he was pretty clearly hampered. So what's your gut feeling for Boston in either of these matchups? Celtics in five or six. They're so overwhelmingly talented. And the reason I say five or six, I think the other team probably steals one game. Again, maybe hmm. two, but that has way Chicago? more to do with. I just think Boston takes their foot off the pedal one game or something, you know, just lets them linger around, hang around, take a game, just Boston playing with their food. Um, Boston's going to win this series pretty convincingly. I I'll go Boston in five. I would take Boston in five against Miami. Obviously, Jimmy is the big question mark here. Without Jimmy, they just do not have nearly enough offensive pop to make this an interesting series, even with Jimmy. I don't think they have an, enough offensive pop. Without the sort of outlier shooting we saw last year, I just think they're too dependent on him rising to this ridiculous level that if he is at all hampered, he's not going to be capable of. And you just see it against Philly, right? They're so damn small, especially against a, a big rim protector like Embiid. It feels like every single time they're kind of praying that they're going to be able to finish around the rim. Bam's too inconsistent offensively. And Boston is just too ridiculously good. Miami could muck that series up a little bit throw the zone at them in heavy doses that could make things ugly like Boston really really struggled against that look last year I do think KP can have a bit of value as a zone breaker a big guy you can throw the ball to in the middle of the floor and ultimately Boston's just too good Miami's offense is too limited Chicago with Caruso hurt I, that would be a sweep like shout out to them dude they've been playing their asses off lately they've been playing better I would confidently pick Boston to win that in a sweep all right now our in-depth preview out east. One of the most interesting series in these playoffs as well, Logan. So many really fun series this year where it feels like effectively a toss-up. You don't often get that with as many first-rounders as we have this year. And I agonized over this one, so I'm interested to see where you ended up. Knicks Sixers, what's your first key here? I agonized over this one too, man. I'm... Yeah. I'm really excited for this series. Minnesota Phoenix is one of my favorites. I think I'm most excited for Philadelphia, New York, just considering like the rabid fan bases, the rivalry here, you know, Eastern conference down and dirty. Like it's going to be, mm. I mean, just like the Philly fans crack me up too, man. It's like whatever happened in the last five minutes dictates how they're feeling, you know, booing them as they're going off the court. Philly fans are funny, man. Uh, I want to be clear about something, man. I believe in both of these teams, and I think the winner of this series is going to knock off the Bucks in the semifinals. Mm. I think that both of these teams are well-equipped to make a conference finals run this year and to beat Milwaukee. My first key, uh, I'll focus on uh, the Sixers' side. How much can the Knicks disrupt Philly and how close to 100% is Joel Embiid? We only saw one game of Joel Embiid in the regular season versus Knicks roster. I uh, put up 30 points, 10 boards, 3 assists on 44% uh, from the field with 6 turnovers. Uh, the stat line mm -hmm. may seem good. 6 turnovers and Philly was negative 29 in the minutes that he was on there on the floor. I think primarily because the Knicks match up really physically well with Joel Embiid. Now, Julius Randle isn't out there, but the matchup that Embiid is going to be drawing all night long 
is Hardenstein and Mitchell Robinson. Both of those guys are big as hell. They're strong. They're physical. They're going to body Embiid. And on drives to the rack, they're just going to make it tough, man, around them. The Knicks swarm. They play great defense. Like, this is one of the most grittiest, hustle, hard energy teams in basketball. I think when you saw it a little bit against Miami, uh, you know, when Embiid puts his head down and backs down in the post and stuff like that, like they are going to try to knock the ball loose. When he's going up for shots, the Knicks are going to collapse and they're going to try to swat that ball out. It's going to be a really physically taxing series on Joel Embiid uh, in terms of just physicality. Like, he's going to get hacked. It is going to be a war of attrition for Embiid and really just to survive the physicality that the Knicks bring. That's one of the hardest things about playing New York is they are just going to bruise you, batter you, beat you up, and it's going to be a matter of can you make it to game six? Can you make it to game seven? Without dying. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah. I think another big key about Joel Embiid is will his jump shot be hitting? I think you saw this against Miami, and big credit to Miami. Uh, Their voodoo magic and what they do in the playoffs, man, they switch to that zone, and they just completely stifle Philly's offense, man. Uh, These are just first-half numbers, but they were uh, 3 of 18 from deep. They were 5 of 19 versus the zone. Uh, 3 of 18, excuse me, overall from deep. They were 1 of 10 uh, when Miami switched to that zone from deep in the first half, and and B couldn't get anything, man. Uh, 10 points, 2 of 8 in the first half. Coming out of the third quarter, he was 3 of 12 with 12 points. And what really was troublesome to me, Carson, wasn't the fact that his jumper wasn't just not hitting. It's kind of how that affects his game overall. When his jumper isn't hitting, the centers can drop on him and counteract that, and they'll let him shoot. And Embiid won't shoot. And he'll be passive. Um... And it also just eliminates the runway that Embiid can normally have when his jumper's hitting. Any For any player in the league, when your jumper's hitting, you give him a little pump fake, boom. Rest of the game, you have got the defender uh, questioning himself defensively, and that's where you want them. When your jumper's hitting, you give him that little jab, that little fake, boom. Got him in the air, opens up the lane for Embiid, easy buckets. If his jumper's not hitting, it really eradicates everything else that the offense and Embiid can do. But the more troublesome thing that I saw Carson against Miami was the fact that Embiid was so passive. You know, his jumper wasn't hitting, and I'm screaming at my television going, dude, the Sixers have to break this run up. This is a bad lull. This is a bad streak. Embiid needs to go get the ball. He needs to go take over this game and command it. And that's honestly probably the the scariest thing for me about Embiid in this series. It's not, oh, is a jumper going to be hitting? When his game goes through lulls and when the Sixers can't generate offense, does he have it within himself to go be the best player and take over the game? That's what the Sixers need. We can't have... They are so much more offensively talented around Embiid now. With Kelly Oubre, with Tobias Harris, with Tyrese freaking Maxi, man. With Buddy Heald, with Nick Batum turning back the clock. God bless you, Nick Batum. That was awesome, man. Fire me so up, awesome. buddy. Um but Embiid is the guy. You're, we cannot have him just whimper and cower away. He looked like a kid who had lost his mom in the grocery store. He looked lost out there, man. Like, we cannot have that Joel Embiid in a playoff series. If the Sixers want to win this series, we need to get that Embiid every single game. It is showing up, it is punching in, and it's handling business. And I'm scared that Embiid is mm. going to disappear like that and this isn't fully on him either because I think he's not at 100 percent and that is a component of this he just hasn't you know it's been a really short stretch trying to get him back to being 100 percent so I don't think he's in a rhythm right now and I don't think this is apex Joel Embiid that we're getting but he's gonna have to play himself back up to speed really quick and in a tough hard nosed series and I think that's a tall ask and I didn't like what I saw against Miami man like Credit to him for being more aggressive in the fourth quarter, for trying to get to more of his looks. I need that all game long. You're the leader of this team. I need you to take over in these big moments. And I just didn't like how passive he was when it got grimy and mucked up against Miami in the first half. So that really is the first key to me, man, is how the Knicks can affect him and what Joel Embiid does when the going gets tough. I just think he's a little more easier to game plan for, man. Um, I think he's more susceptible to making mistakes on blitzes and traps. 
I think he doesn't punish teams enough when they double him. I think he can fall asleep with the ball in his hands and get picked on. And like I said, I think he's just more passive and prone to disappearing when his shots aren't falling. I also think the other question with Embiid is how favorable is his whistle in this series? Are the refs going to be willing to give him all the calls that he got in the regular season? I love the whistle in Miami, uh, Philly. I love the whistle. Um, They let those boys play. They let them play Mm -hmm. physical. And I hope they let uh, them play here in this one. Um, But I got a lot of question marks about Embiid, man. And I really wonder if he can survive the physicality and the brute force of this series and withstand and stay mentally strong when his shots aren't falling. So those are my real concerns on the Philly and Embiid side. This is pretty obviously the key factor for this series. Like, it's all about what version of Embiid you get, and you hit on a great point. You are in for a war. There is not a tougher series that you can draw, just in terms of the physicality and the intensity and the effort that the opposing team is going to play with than the New York Knicks. Like, Miami would be a close second, but New York is even a little bit bigger they have in my opinion even more quality defenders they don't have the zone element of it but they absolutely have the personnel to make this a rock fight and it's very tough to evaluate Joel Embiid at this point because we only have a handful of games since he came back from injury and for the most part I thought he looked pretty solid yesterday was legitimately concerning to me for a number of reasons like first of all the way that he struggled against the zone the way that he dealt with the zone I think there were a number of factors there. Part of it is just Philly as a whole looked unprepared and his teammates did not do a good job. There were too many stagnant possessions where it's just, all right, nobody penetrates the zone. We're just kind of swinging the ball around the perimeter. Nobody really looked all that comfortable throwing an entry pass. Like Kelly Oubre probably isn't going to excel there. And so you get a lot of the tough catch and shoot threes. That is exactly what they want to bait you into out of those looks. At the same time, Embiid was struggling to finish his catches. They were bothering him by crowding him and pestering him. He was struggling to finish in those crowded paints, even when he's five inches taller than everybody else and he has a clean look like he was still missing those. And I don't want to compare him to Jokic here, but I'm about to because there's just a very stark difference when you compare how these dominant bigs fare versus zone, just generally versus teams drawing up a specific scheme for them. We talk about how Jokic is basically impervious to that. Embiid very much is not. And you see that here in his feel, his assertiveness, just getting the ball, right? Jokic is so great at finding those soft spots. And then once he does, he is going to finish that catch. And then he's going to put a floater up over you that is like 65, 70%, or depending on who was there in the middle of that zone, maybe he's going to bully somebody or he's going to spot a cutter or he's going to make the perfect kick out and i will also say that's where like philly's supporting cast bears responsibility they were pretty stagnant off ball early in this game as well they weren't moving to open space very well so it was definitely a combination of Embiid struggling and the supporting cast not making life easier on him but that was just a concerning performance to me the zone is a specific look but what was concerning broadly is just how worn down and bothered he seemed by a defense that was just going to be that annoying he looked exhausted Doris Burke was talking about how he looked exhausted in the warm-up like he slimmed down but if he's not in the sort of game shape that he needs to be to carry an absurd load against an elite defense I just can't super confidently bet on Philly here and he made plays down the stretch of that game like that's where I want to give him a bunch of props he stepped into a couple open threes and knocked them down he got the and one off an offensive board he dotted up Kelly Oubre off that double really nice pass at the end of the game so he definitely got more comfortable I thought that Philly as a whole did a much better job with the zone in the second half and just produced better offense and he impacted the game in other ways even if his uh, shot and finishing wasn't on He impacted the game on the glass, was monstrous there. Defensively, I already mentioned, like, just such an imposing rim protector. But ultimately, that was not the Joel Embiid that they need if they want to go deep. Because they need Joel Embiid to be a superhero. They need him to be close to regular season Embiid. I like some of the supporting cast here. I love Tyrese Maxey. I love Nick Batum. I think Oubre's had a good season. Wish DeAnthony Melton were healthy. Maybe he gets healthy. He can be an impact player in this series. But they need him to be the best player on the floor by far in a series like this because the Knicks are going to harass him, man. You mentioned the six turnovers. 
guys like Brunson and Dante DiVincenzo and Josh Hart just have such good instincts on timing doubles, on defensive playmaking. There was a play in the Heat game that exactly mirrored a play from the last game against the Knicks, which is where Embiid is basically just dribbling, dribbling, facing the perimeter back to the basket, waiting for a handoff to develop, and he just takes a split second too long. Jimmy makes a play. In the Knicks game, I believe it was Brunson who made a play. Like, MB just doesn't always have the awareness necessary in those situations, and that has hurt him in playoff series. And this is the matchup where it's going to hurt you. And I also think if you have OG and Hartenstein as the primary defenders for that Maxi MB two-man game, well, uh, that's pretty problematic because you can legitimately switch OG on Embiid and he can hold up there. I also think you mentioned the playoff whistle is a factor here because they're going to be crazy physical. And I don't think you are going to see Embiid get anything close to a regular season whistle. So he can absolutely reach that level where it's like, yeah, the Knicks are really well built to guard him. But in single coverage, like Hardenstein is still going to really, really struggle with locked in Joel Embiid. They're going to have to basically pressure him with doubles and get janky defensively. That's what they're going to have to do, muck this series up. And if Embiid holds up there and if he is really nails as a playmaker and if he can just bear the physical load of it, then Philly should probably win this series. But to me, with the Embiid that we are looking at right now, coming off the injury, not in the best rhythm, maybe not in the best shape, against the defense this great, considering his playoff history and some of the limitations, it just feels like a lot, a lot to ask. And I am not going to discount the possibility that he can do it, but they need him to be so good. And uh, I just think it's a tough matchup. I think it's a very tough matchup. And on the inverse of that too, it's like, I can see, you know, I can see the Knicks and how they can slow them down. And then on the inverse of that, it's like, the Knicks just have such a diverse offensive attack. And I am concerned about the Knicks offensively, too. That's the biggest key to me in this series as well on the flip side of the ball. It's can Jalen Brunson withstand this massive offensive load without yeah. Julius Randle? Um, since Randle went out, Jalen Brunson has been averaging 32-7-3 on 48-37-86 splits, a true shooting percentage of 58.5. And the Knicks have had the number six offense post-All-Star break them. 21 and 15 uh, since Randall's injury. The guy that's going to have to step up alongside Jalen Brunson in that offensive role is OG Ananobi, though. And I like it. Like, you know, I, I don't think people, it's the thing that I think people conflate, like, or, or, or just confuse. A Embiid is one of the best players in all of the NBA. It is an absolute apex, right? Joel Embiid offensively at his absolute floor can have these really bad games. Jalen Brunson's ceiling may not be all the way up near where an Embiid's is, but his floor is so damn high. Jalen Brunson is so consistent. And I just trust him against any team, any defense, any coverage, any matchup to generate high-quality offense. And so that's the question mark in this series. Can Embiid rise and take this team's ceiling to that high? Because Brunson's going to keep coming. And Brunson's going to keep coming. What else do we get out of OG offensively that takes them over the top? Because the Knicks have a really high baseline, and he's going to generate a really high shot quality for his teammates. I mean, they have real improved shooting, and, you know, Julius Randle being out, Carson, I think is problematic because you don't have that real secondary offensive star, but you're mm -hmm. likely going to have much better spot-up shooting without Julius Randle surrounding them. OG Ananobi. Dante DiVincenzo been one of the best catching shooters in the NBA this season. Uh, Boyan Bogdanovich is now out there. Hasn't been shooting great. Uh, Deuce McBride. Uh, you know, Josh Hart has his moments. I think he's like a 30% shooter this year, but, you know, he has his moments. Plays good ball. That was their problem last year. You know, the Knicks were a really great defense. They had Brunson leading the show, but you were counting on R.J. Barry and Julius, uh, Julius Randle knocking down open looks, and they just weren't capable of doing it. And I'll remind you too, dude, these numbers are absurd, Carson. I texted you these before the show. These are ridiculous, man. With OG Ananobi, this team is 20-3. and three. They're 16.5 points per 100 possessions better defensively with OG Ananobi on the floor. They have a defensive rating of 101.8 with yeah. OG and a 118.3 defensive rating without him. And this is the stupidest number I found. They play like a 77-win team with OG Ananobi on the floor. 
77 and 5. Yeah, I've never seen a number like that. Again, granted, it's a 23 game sample size. That's absurd. So that sample tells us that this Knicks defense makes life hard with their starters out there on everybody. Yeah. They just make the game ugly. And in their regular season matchups against Philadelphia, uh, the one matchup with Embiid, the Knicks won 128 to 92. And again, these other matchups are without Embiid, so do with these numbers what you will. The Knicks had an offensive rating of 112.4. Sixers had a defensive rating of 112.4. And the Knicks had a defensive rating of 92.8. 76ers had an offensive rating of 92.8. Oh, that is how it works. That is how it works, if you didn't know. (laughs) Uh, I just figured I'd provide that for context. So, the Knicks were legitimately able to stifle the Sixers with or without Joel Embiid. And they were able to kind of get what they want, man. And I think they're an improved team from last year. I trust Jalen Brunson's baseline. This is a really tough series, Carson. I can see it going either way, man. I literally flipped on this. I called an audible right before we started the show. I'm going to take the Knicks in seven. I agree. And there's a couple more reasons. First of all, the Knicks defense is just absolutely insane. And uh, I do think that they are built to... uh, really test some of those pressure points for Joel Embiid that we have seen historically him struggle with in the playoffs. I also think they can really bother Tyrese Maxey. And that's the guy who it's like, even if Embiid isn't on his A game, he can explode, but it's a tough matchup for him too. They have awesome point of attack options. And I think Deuce McBride could be a key player in this series. I do wonder, Logan, if Josh Hart just can't make a shot does Tibbs turn to McBride as the starter? Because he's an absolute hound. He's a better point of attack defender. The problem there is you're conceding size, you're conceding rebounding, where Hart is obviously way, way better than his size. But just like the pure point of attack defense and having a legitimately damn good three-point shooter out there instead of a question mark, I could see that outweighing the value that Hart brings in stretches. But OG is an awesome, awesome mashup on Tyrese Maxey. And... This is where I'm bummed that Julius Randle isn't healthy in this series. When we did see the matchup where like all these guys were healthy, the one game that you mentioned, which the Knicks won very convincingly, you were able to have OG as the primary defender on Maxi because Randle is so big that you're not worried about, okay, Tobias Harris is just going to absolutely bully whoever we have on him because we're sizing everybody else down and putting our second biggest player on their point guard. That dynamic is different when Randall isn't out there. So unfortunately, I don't think OG can be the primary defender on Maxi in this series just because then, I know everybody hates Tobias Harris. It is so funny to me how much Philly fans hate him. I feel genuinely bad for that dude. Like, I understand why they have contempt for him. Inconsistent dude who they paid a ridiculous amount of money. But it's so funny to me that like he misses a shot and immediately they're just raining booze down upon him. That's tough to play like that. But... The reality is that if OG is on Maxi, the Knicks are big in terms of the four and five. Well, they're not huge, but like they're just so damn physical. They're strong with Hartenstein and OG, but one to three, they're small. And Harris is a legitimately really good mismatch attacker. He's big. He's a, a really good like turnaround shot maker. He can just take advantage of those. He's a 75th percentile post-up player. So uh, he could be a very important third source of on-ball creation in this series if he can pinpoint some of those smaller guards. But if it's not OG as the primary matchup on Maxi, uh, like they just have a really good collective unit. Josh Hart, Dante, all those guys are pesky. So I think they have the ability to bother the Sixers' two most important offensive players by far. They're two offensive stars. I think their defense is awesome. And then the key question is really... What you said, like, can Jalen Brunson keep being a superhero? The two most important keys in this series to me are pretty intuitive. It's how does each team's best offensive player and best player period play? But it's because both of them bear very significant burdens. And beat it's a really tough matchup. Brunson, it's just he has to do so damn much. Down the stretch, last 17 games, he averaged over 35 a night. And the Knicks went 12 and 5. And doesn't look like Philly's going to have DeAnthony Melton in this series. They're not going to have him to start. It's been weird. Like, he's come back in short spurts over the last couple months, but hasn't consistently stayed on the floor. He would be a good point of attack option. But Ubre has guarded Brunson 
pretty well. And he's super long, 7'3 wingspan. He's quick. So that could be a problematic matchup for him. I could just see that sort of length uh, taking a bit of a toll on him over this series. But Embiid is going to sit and drop. And if you're talking about what Brunson can do out of pick and roll, first of all, almost nobody is more prolific just in terms of the load that they can carry there. But almost no guard in the league is better at killing you in drop with that short range shot making. Brunson shoots 53% in the paint outside the restricted area. So if he gets those looks consistently, which he will just by the design of Philly's coverage, he can create you a lot of good offense. And the Knicks do have really good spot up shooters where they didn't last year. They have good cutters. They have a skilled touch finishing big who can also beat you against drop with his floater game and Hartenstein. But Brunson has to create everything. He has good play finishers, but as a small guard, who has been doing this now for a couple of months, that is a big burden against a legitimately good defense. But post-Randall injury, they're still sixth in offensive rating. Like, he's just one of those guys, man. He's one of them ones. I think he can do it. I have thought that it's too much of him to bear to make a deep run in this Eastern Conference, but considering the questions I have about Embiid and considering how damn good the Knicks' defense is, I think I buy into it for this series. And... The one thing I regret most about our top 10 contender rankings was not having the Knicks on there. We did that a couple weeks ago. Most of it I feel pretty good about. Philly at 9, I actually still feel good about. In a weird way, it feels appropriate to have Philly above the Knicks just because I still think their upside is higher. The best version of Philly where Embiid is just destroying everybody. Like, the ceiling there is uh, very, very, very high. But the floor with this Knicks team, because of their defensive foundation, because of Brunson's consistency, because they just have so many damn good basketball players. Like, they really do. When they play so together, they play so hard. I'm going to lean on that. I also think it's important how Brunson controls the pace in this series and that he makes it a kind of grinded out series because the Sixers don't play super fast, but they are a very effective transition offense. They score with 87th percentile efficiency there. And Maxi. He's going to be drawing these tough matchups in the half court. Full court, he's so damn fast. He's a problem. Kelly Oubre is another guy who's at his best in the open floor in transition, weaponizing his athleticism. Tobias Harris is pretty damn good in transition. So the Knicks play at the slowest pace in the league. Brunson is a huge part of that. I think they want to keep this a half court series, lean on their incredible shot creator. The guys around him need to knock down their shots and then defend their asses off. I think that's a good enough formula. I'm going to take them in seven. I wish I had sw- uh, swapped the Heat and the Knicks in my rankings. Oh, 100%. And they just have more juice, man. Yeah. They have that guy offensively. 100%. Like, I... Uh, and better I mean, supporting I, cast offensively. Yeah, yeah. I said that, um, you know, the Knicks would have been third if they had a healthy Julius Randle. And I think it keeps them from being able to, like, legitimately win the finals or get there. But... Yeah. Yeah, man. I just... I really love what the Knicks do. I love what... I love their formula. I love them top to bottom. I love Tibbs. I love everything about the Knicks, man, except the fact that they don't have a manual quickly anymore. That hurts. R.I.P. Uh, I believe in the Knicks, man, just a little more than I believe in Philadelphia. And I think it it's sucks, close. man, because I think we're due for probably another bad offseason of Joel Embiid discourse, and I really don't hold it against him this time. Like, previous years, I think you really can. Um I don't know, and maybe Embiid perseveres and puts his team on his back and finally breaks through, and this is the series that can validate him. Uh, I, I just don't anticipate it, man. I want so badly for Embiid to have a stretch post-All-Star break where he is fully healthy going into the playoffs. Mm-hmm. He's locked in. He's engaged. We don't have to worry about all this drama, and he can go in here and he can dominate. I just don't think this is that postseason. So I'm taking the Knicks, but I think we are due for a phenomenal series, man, between two great basketball teams. Yeah, boy, oh boy. And with the way that I have uh, Pacers Bucks, which we're about to talk about going, because I have an upset there, whoever wins this series, if that were to happen, I would take to the conference finals. Philly has that kind of ceiling. I think that this is a war no matter what. I still think Embiid is the best player on the floor, but it's just he has to be the best player on the floor by a good margin because the Knicks are the more complete basketball team. And the Randall dynamic is interesting. I legitimately think the Knicks have a higher floor without Julius Randall because at the end of the day, 
you get the most high quality defenders on the floor you don't have the downside of oh my god randall shot us out of this game randall's playmaking fell apart randall can't knock down a spot up jumper he's a black hole but i do still think to beat like boston they need that ceiling they need a bully they need uh i do think that additional size is valuable it's incredible though they've been third in rebound rate even after the randall injury and with og injured for a good portion of that stretch like that's ridiculous they are just so damn good on the glass but just to have that second real high-end shot creator that extends their ceiling i'm not a julius randall guy but i ultimately think if the knicks make the conference finals this year we are going to hear a lot of oh my god they're better without randall and it won't necessarily be true i think part of it will be they're just really, really good now that they have OG and now that they've put together this awesome cast of role players and Brunson has ascended. And also, uh, depending on who they get in the second round, it could be a more favorable draw. But these are two of the top four teams in the East, I would say. I, I was giving Miami sort of the reputational nod in that same tier. I just think their basketball talent is a level below. This is two teams that have been playing awesome basketball. The Sixers are 32-8 and eight with Embiid. The Knicks are 20-3 and three with OG. That is not your typical 2-7 uh, matchup, especially when the East mostly sucks. Like, there's a lot of really flawed teams here, and uh, these are two of definitely the best ones. One really random question before we move on. How do you feel about playing Kyle Lowry more than Buddy Heald? Would you do that? No. Okay. I have Tyrese Maxey, man. I don't need Kyle Lowry airballing threes and uh, Disrespect. doing dumb Kyle Lowry stuff, man. Playoff grinder Kyle Lowry, little things guy Kyle Lowry. I think I would probably go buddy. I just think like the shooting is so dynamic and it ups the ceiling for them having, a little bit. But they've been leaning on Lowry a good bit. Having, I just like the way Buddy, just buddy really understands his role and is so much more of a weapon from deep. Like just having him and maxi on the perimeter is so deadly like if if buddy can just get a sliver or tyrese can just get a sliver man they're lighting you up i think i think his shooting is just so game changing yeah lowry's been shooting really well too though he's had a really good year shooting and obviously you have the playmaking the iq i think it will kind of depend on who's playing better but it has surprised me a bit how much more they've been leaning on lowry than buddy because i really thought that was a good pickup for them all right Let's talk Pacers Bucks, Logan. What's your pick here? I'm taking, I believe I took the Bucks in six. Uh, this one scares me, man, just because Giannis apparently isn't going to be healthy, uh, might miss. We don't know how many games. You know, I'm anticipating him missing the first two, but all we've heard is that he's going to miss the start of the series. And so this is a tough challenge, man. Milwaukee got dogged by Indiana, regardless of how Giannis dominated in the regular season. My anticipations for this series, I think Damian Lillard and Chris Middleton can float this offense enough, and I am scared of Indiana just turning this into a track meet and lighting Milwaukee up. Uh, I am scared of that. That being said, I think Dame turns back the clock a little bit. I think he balls out. I think Chris Middleton pulls his weight heavily, um, and the Bucks can float this thing until Giannis gets back, and Giannis just is the best player in this series and transforms it. But that's all I'm banking on, man. If Giannis mm -hmm. misses... The, the the thing is, is just if the Bucks drop the first couple of games or, you know, it's 2-0, it's 2-1, there's so little margin for error when Indiana has matched up so well against them. Yeah. They've just got to play perfect ball. And so Indiana does scare me, but I'm going to take the veteran team. I'm going to take Dame balling out. So I'm going to take Milwaukee in six. This one was tough to decide between, though. This is probably my boldest first-round pick. I'm taking Indiana here in six and uh part of this is expecting Giannis to miss the first couple games the reality may be that if Milwaukee drops game one at home they rush him back and I think Milwaukee is the better team with Giannis on the floor but I think if he does miss those first two and it seems like they want to proceed cautiously obviously it's the playoffs but it's a calf thing you don't want that to turn into an Achilles thing like that's a little bit dangerous I just think Indiana is way better than Milwaukee when Giannis is not on the floor. I think that they are a significantly better offense. They have been elite there, even though Halley hasn't been his best post-All-Star break. I think that they are specifically built to pick apart Milwaukee's defensive personnel and coverages. They are going to play Brooke Lopez and drop. They will get toasted doing that. 
by Halley's pull-up shooting and his overall touch. If they try to blitz, then there's just way too much shooting alongside him. I think Brook is like hard for Milwaukee to play in this series. When Giannis isn't out there, they do not have a good answer for Siakam. And so the two offensive stars are both well positioned to eat. Indiana plays fast and they have shooting everywhere you have to cover. Milwaukee is old and they are slow. And without Giannis on the floor, I did just don't trust Dame and the old guys, Dame and the retirement community to produce good enough, reliable enough offense. I think it's predictable. I think it's stagnant. I think there's a lack of rim pressure. I think there's a lack of overall athleticism and explosiveness. So the reason that I'm taking Indiana here is I think it's basically a blitzkrieg early. I think it's Giannis misses a couple games. Indiana takes both. I think they're significantly better than Milwaukee when Giannis is not on the floor. I think he covers up so many flaws with that team. And if you drop two at home, that's probably too much to overcome. I wouldn't put it past them just because Giannis is so damn good. He'll be the best player on the floor by so much, but I'm taking Indiana here. I really don't like Milwaukee without Giannis on the floor. Okay, Cavs magic, Logan. 4-5, what's your pick? This is going to be a grimy one, a nasty, nasty throwback kind of 90s basketball series. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm very excited for it. Uh, I'm going to take the magic in seven. Uh Honestly, what this came down to was the Cavaliers' lineup continuity. I don't trust the coaching staff to really stagger these guys' minutes when I think they should, when I think the Cavs are better, when you give Donovan Mitchell shooting, when you give Darius Garland shooting, when you mix and match these guys. So I don't trust the lineup continuity or construction. I'm, I'm skeptical about the rotation. And then I think the Magic just have more quality basketball players. Like, they just have more guys that I like, and that was the – determining factor for me um i think it's going to be an ugly series and orlando's shooting outside of the paint scares me uh i said this during our preview show if you guys want to go back and watch they were 28th in effective field goal percentage outside of the paint this season that's really concerning against one a team that orlando gets most of their points downhill inside the paint at the rim against a team with two really dominant rim deterrents in Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. Mm -hmm. So that certainly is a matchup that I don't like as a person betting on Orlando. But again, I just think Orlando has more quality basketball players. So I'm going to take them. This was, this was tough. I'm going to take the magic in seven. This is probably the most surprising pick to me of yours. I'm taking Cleveland in six here. I absolutely think it's going to be a rock fight. It's going to be ugly as hell, dude. These are two teams that are absolutely built to defend their asses off, that have awesome personnel, that are well built to guard each other, and that also are lacking in offensive skill in their own ways. I just think Cleveland has by far the most reliable and most dynamic shot creator on the floor. Donovan Mitchell has had his issues with the knee injury, but the last couple games I thought he looked good enough to where I'm confident in him being the best player on the floor in this series. They could have the two best offensive players, depending on what version of Garland you get. And I worry about things getting real ugly for Orlando because you mentioned the dominant interior defense from Cleveland. It is also the collection of big wings and just the fact that their bigs can guard in space so you can throw at Paolo and Franz and uh, make this a physical, tough series for those guys offensively and really just uh, disrupt their offense, make that shot quality tough. And ultimately, I don't trust their shot making enough. So the highs have been a lot higher for Cleveland. The offensive punch we have seen when Mitchell is going, when they do play the right combinations. I really like the depth of wings here. I think they have a lot of options. It's very different from last year to me, like this Cleveland team. Because Okoro is so much better, because Dean Wade, if he's healthy, has been so good this year defensively and knocks down his shots offensively. It's just a better collection. Yang, Struess. It's still not like the upper echelon, but there are combinations where they're super switchable. They have one great shot creator, and then they have one great interior defender and rim protector. I don't like Cleveland long-term because I worry about their offense. Like against Boston, good luck, bro. They just don't have enough pop. But uh, Orlando has the least pop of anybody in the playoff field, and so I'm going to bet on uh, the better offense with the best offensive player here. All right, now we're into theoretical veils. So we'll move quickly through these because they very well may not happen. But we'll start with our second round matchups out West. We both have Dallas OKC. What's your pick here? I am taking Dallas to win this one. Um, I'm going to take the Mavericks in, I think, six. You know, I, uh -huh. I think I think Dallas matches up really well physically with them. Gafford and Lively, I think, is a potent 
interior combination. And I just think Luke is going to be the best player on the floor. Uh, credit to SGA. Um, but I think Luke is going to be the best player on the floor. And I think the Mavericks just match up really well physically with OKC. I would take Dallas in six as well. This isn't a no brainer to me at all, but it does matter to me having that just like absolutely unstoppable force on the floor. And SGA has been so damn good this year, but offensively, I do still think Luca is up a level and physically, I believe in him dominating in a series like this. And Dallas just has really good length and size and rebounding and rim protection on the interior now, or like not elite rebounding, but uh, definitely better than what they did have. And then I just look at who has like more red flags and I think Josh Giddy is still a red flag to me for OKC. He's been playing much better, but uh, there was a game this year where Dallas didn't guard him, man. And then you're playing four on five offensively. And they can pull him and they can go to Kaysaw they can go to Isaiah Joe. They can go to Aaron Wiggins. They have good options, but will they? I don't know. Like Dagnall has tended to play Giddy a good amount this year, even when he's looked really, really bad. And I do think that slightness the overall win experience for OKC. There's enough things where I lean Dallas. Also having a second shot creator, the caliber of Kyrie. I love J-Dub. He's not at that level offensively. Give me Dallas in this one in six as well. Denver, Minnesota, what's your pick? Mm, I think this is going to be a really good matchup, but I think the Nuggets finish it in five. I think this is mm. where the offensive limitations of Minnesota really come back to get them. Uh, Everybody wants to talk about how well Minnesota matches up with Denver physically. Denver matches up with Minnesota physically. You know what I mean? It goes both ways. Like, uh, I think I think this is just where Jokic and Murray, you know, the Timberwolves can slow down Denver a little bit, but I don't think they slow them down enough. So I think it's a really good five-game series, but it is going to be a five-game series. So I'll take Denver in five. I'll take it to go six just because – Nobody guards Denver as well as Minnesota. It's honestly not that close. They have the best defense in the league, but also specifically in this matchup because of what they can do with Cat as the primary post defender, Gobert as the helper. That has been more effective than any other defensive look anybody can throw at Denver. They have Jaden and Ant to throw at Jamal at the point of attack. I just think they uh, make this series tougher on Denver than anybody else can. Nobody will make them as uncomfortable as Minnesota does. At the same time, can they grind out enough offensive production against uh, this team when they are still going to be a really, really good offense, Denver? I don't think so because Minnesota doesn't have the physical advantages here like they do against a Phoenix. Like, this Denver defense is good. They don't have small guards to attack. Uh, they're big in the front court, so I just think uh, Denver's offense is too damn good. And that's why I've always struggled with, like, people saying Minnesota is the best equipped to beat Denver especially after the emergence of Dallas I can see it because they defend them better but you gotta create enough good shots man this is an all-time offense you have to create good shots and Minnesota is just limited there still in the scope of these really good playoff teams okay how about Celtics magic for you Logan what's your pick uh this one I think Boston pretty handedly uh finishes yeah. off Orlando give me the Celtics in five talent gap you know, Orlando probably steals a game because of their size and defense, but that's about it. I would take Boston to beat Cleveland in five. Just a significantly better team. Awesome point of attack defenders, more offensive skill, personnel to hunt Mitchell and Garland out there because everybody on Boston is like a, a big guard or a big strong wing who's super skilled. They have more shooting. They have definitely fewer weak points. Like, I still worry, okay, what if Mobley and Allen just totally drag down your offense with their lack of skill in a series? It's a no-brainer. Boston is a juggernaut, and Cleveland has been playing really, really badly as of late. I'm picking them to Orlando just because I think Orlando isn't offensively uh, equipped to win a playoff series right now, but against Boston, there's a big margin. Okay, Knicks-Bucks is your second-round matchup. What's your pick here? Spoiled this a little bit earlier. I am going to take the Knicks to beat the Bucks. Uh, I'm going to take the Knicks in six. I think the Knicks match up really well with Milwaukee physically. I think they provide really interesting deterrence for Giannis. And considering how bad Milwaukee's defense has been, I just don't know if Milwaukee can convincingly stop anybody enough to make me consider them to be real title contenders. And let's face it, guys. 
Milwaukee has Doc Rivers heading the ship, man. There's no mm-hmm. way they can get to the Eastern Conference Finals. So, uh, considering my skepticism of uh, Doc Rivers, my skepticism of Milwaukee uh, transforming to even a good defense, uh, I think the Knicks are just a better two-way team. If I were to have that matchup, I think I would probably take Milwaukee, actually. That's what scares me about this pick. It's like, I'm betting on Giannis missing a couple games, and uh, maybe he just doesn't. And if he doesn't, I still think he is so ridiculously good. He's the best player in the conference, and Dame as an offensive number two is still pretty good. They're a super flawed team, but that just overwhelming star quotient, I would probably pick if you have healthy Giannis and... uh, that's still scary, but I don't have healthy Giannis in my world. I have the Indiana Pacers playing the Knicks, and I think it's the Knicks there, I would say, in six. I think both these teams are really, really good offensively. There is a huge gap defensively. It's really uh, not that close here just because I know that New York can uh, make that Indiana offense uncomfortable in a way that they cannot return the favor. Okay, conference finals, Logan. We both have Denver, Dallas. What's your pick here? I think this is going to be a great series. Uh, I think the Mavs make the Nuggets work a little bit. I'm going to say Nuggets in six. Uh, I think you hit on a really key point in the Minnesota series or about Minnesota versus Dallas. I just think Dallas, you need to be able to create easy offense, and Luka and Kyrie are going to be able to do some of that, enough to steal a couple games. Gafford and Lively can limit, you know, this defense a little bit on the interior, or uh, Nuggets offense a little bit on the interior, but Nuggets are just overwhelming. Um, And so, yeah, I don't see it going seven, but I think the Mavs steal a couple of games. So give me Denver in six. I'm going to take Denver in six as well. Dallas just ultimately still has more question marks, even though they've been absolutely humming as of late. The Nuggets have the best player on the floor. Dallas has the rare opportunity to have the best player on the floor. Luka could outplay Jokic in a series. That's something only a couple of dudes can say, but I wouldn't expect it. And it's ultimately more about the supporting cast. I just think every offensive player fills their role at a very high level. Nobody plays with the synergy and the chemistry and just the collective mindset of the Denver Nuggets. Like the gap between my confidence in MPJ and KCP and Aaron Gordon versus PJ Washington and Derek Jones. Like that's a significant gap. And that's kind of what it comes down to. I know the Nuggets starting five, everybody is going to do their job at a really high level. They are also still bigger. Dallas has improved there, but uh, Denver has those physical advantages in the front court. I don't think Dallas is well equipped ultimately to uh, slow down Jokic and the Nuggets offense. I don't think they're a bad defense, but I do think that there are, weak points that can be attacked there and uh, they don't have like a a physical answer for Jokic. Gafford to me isn't even that. So the Mavs offense can explode and because of that they have a lot of upside but Denver's formula is just so damn reliable that I would pick them. And then we also both have Celtics Knicks Logan which is interesting makes me a little bit nervous just because like Jalen Brunson has to do so much for this to happen and I could really see the Knicks losing first round if we get good Joel Embiid. What's your pick here? That's good. I, that's why I thought it was important to emphasize whoever comes out of that series, I think is going to be my representative in the Eastern Conference Finals. Ultimately, I have them both facing the same fate, though, and that is dropping to the Celtics. I think the Knicks make them work. Celtics in seven. Ooh, really? I don't think the Knicks pose as much of a challenge to the Celtics as you do. I think absolutely they can defend their asses off. They can make this series hard on Boston, but this to me is just where the burden on Brunson becomes too much to bear. Not just because this Boston defense is so damn good and they're so well built to guard Brunson because of how many awesome dudes they have at the point of attack who uh, they can put any of those four guys on him in stretches and they will do a hell of a job. It's also just like, all right, man, now you've been doing this for so long and you've been doing it in these playoff environments, playing probably 40 minutes a night. That's just where I think it's like the overwhelmingly talented team is going to be overwhelming. So I would take Boston to win in five there. And it's going to be interesting. I keep thinking about this Milwaukee pick because if Giannis plays sooner than I think, if Giannis looks 100%, like I still think 
they maybe pose the biggest threat to Boston because of the Giannis and Dame factor. But there's not a big gap between them and Philly and New York. It's kind of matchup dependent and who's healthy and whatnot. All right. Finals, Logan. Shocker. We both have Nuggets Celtics. Breaking news. Uh, the two best teams in basketball we expect to meet in the finals. What's your pick here? I am so excited for this. Uh, I have uh, compared it to the Avengers versus Thanos. I think we are. Oh, like that at, movie. Yeah, like the movie. Uh, I think. Oh, like Drake versus the rap game. I, exactly. Oh, exactly. like me versus Stay Hot. Exactly, dude. You're, yeah. You're on a heater right now. Yeah. I don't. I, I, this is a toss up. Flip a coin, man. Boston has assembled the team to match up against Nikola Jokic, Thanos. I'm going to take the Nuggets in seven, though. I think Boston, this is the best chance that they've had. I think this is the best version of Jason Tatum that has, you know, existed. I think this is the best foe that Denver is going to run into. But I'm not, I'm going to bet on the team with the best player on the floor. And I'm going to bet on the big Serb. I'm just not going to bet against Jokic, man. I think Jokic is the best player on the floor. I think they're battle tested. And I think it's going to be a battle, man. Like I, I, like I said, I think nuggets in seven, I think this is going to be an absolute war down to the wire. Um, but in, again, in those one game scenarios, in these very tight games, in these close possession, mm -hmm. you know, battles, I'm going to bet on, on Denver because they've shown it to me. And yeah, man, I don't know. I this is this is a coin toss for me. I could definitely see Boston hoisting the trophy at the end of this, but I think it's going to be a war. Um, and I'm going to take I'm going to take the team with the best player. So I'm going to take Denver. If Boston doesn't get one of these next two, I will be surprised and I will be disappointed. They are just so so talented, and they have that core in place. I'm still going Denver though. Jokic is playing at that level right now. And it's a very rare level in history where you feel like this dude is such an individual force that he's just going to will you there. Denver is also a really good basketball team, but the gap between him and everybody else on the floor is so significant. He controls the game offensively and physically imposes himself and is such a uniquely great shot maker in and around the paint that it's like nothing we've ever seen before. And I don't think Boston has good answers to take that away. They are a great team defense, but we saw this in the matchup. Like, KP specifically, not a great post defender, not a great rebounder. Jokic, I think, can exploit those advantages. And I think you hit on a key point with the clutch offense. Boston has been significantly better there this year, but nobody is better than Denver. Nobody is more consistently disciplined. Nobody is more consistently excellent in those situations than the Nuggets. They don't turn the ball over. They get great shots. They don't rely on shot variance. And so the floor for Denver is the highest in the league. The ceiling for Boston is is the highest in the league. When Jalen Brown is playing out of his mind and Jason Tatum is hitting 40% of his pull-up threes and also getting downhill and also playmaking well, when everybody is shooting well, like, yeah, dude, they've actually built a super team. It's crazy. They are so, so unbelievably stacked. And this is damn near a toss-up, but I'm going to bet on the more reliably great team. And I do think in these environments, that is Denver because their offense doesn't stop churning. And that is because of Nikola Jokic, who is just one of those all-time special players. So I'm going to go Denver in six, just because it feels maniacal to pick them winning a game seven in Boston. Boston has also been a buzzsaw at home, dude. They are so, so tough to beat there. But if anybody can do it, it's going to be Jokic and the Nuggets. They still, to me, feel like the most inevitable force, the top dog when it comes to those biggest moments, but it's close between these two. And I will say, if the Nuggets do win the title this year, oh my God, what a path. The path that we both just projected, Lakers, who I had as a top four team in the West, Timberwolves, who I had as my third team in the West, Dallas, who I had as my second team in the West, Boston, who I think is legitimately one of the best teams of this century. You can take all of that, oh, you beat the 8th seed, you beat the 7th seed, whatever, last year. That was stupid to begin with, but like, that is a run, dude. They don't get credit for it because they haven't done it. But if they do, wow, that is a run. I mean, put him up there, man. Build the statue. <laughs> well, he hasn't done it. He hasn't done it, but, but I'm just saying, looking at that, it's like, golly, Dude. Boston's going to have their easy series first round. And even after that, they're dealing with 
really flawed teams. Like, the West is a bloodbath, and Denver is not getting any breaks. They don't get to play the Kings or the Pelicans in the first round. They got to play the freaking Lakers, dude. And that's why Boston's been kind of a more popular pick this year is because a lot of people's justification is that the Nuggets' path is just going to have to be so brutally tough. Who's knocking Um, off Boston? I don't have anybody taking Boston past five games in the East. The nerds love Jokic, man. The nerds love Jokic. How could you not? (laughs) He's one of the best to ever do it, man. He really is. So this is going to be awesome. I would take Celtics Nuggets finals for uh, the foreseeable future. I just think that's going to be peak basketball. I'm so, so unbelievably excited. Hope you guys are too, because it is almost playoff time for real. We have those playing games Friday, and then we are going to be pumping out the shows. We are going to be live after a whole lot of these days of playoff action starting Saturday. Then we'll be back Sunday. We will be back most weekdays, especially throughout the first round. Stay tuned in a Nerd Sesh, baby, because the content is coming, because the basketball is going to be awesome, and I am unbelievably excited. So if you enjoyed this one, check out some of the other stuff on our YouTube channel. Check out some of the uh, previous series breakdowns that we've done. Check out our podcast, which you can listen to across audio platforms. You can also uh, check out some of the video essays, video breakdowns that we do on our YouTube page. Definitely want to pump out more of those throughout the playoffs. Check out our trivia uh, across social, TikTok, Instagram at NerdSesh, Twitter at Nerd underscore Sesh. You can also find a diss track there on the Stay Hot podcast. Probably want to give that a listen to. And uh, you can get our merch if you want. You can pluck that hat right off Logan's head. Pluck it off, that very one. He'll ship it to you if you go to thevolume.com and order it. Sweat stains included. Sweat stains included. Lots of nice skin-to-skin contact there. The man doesn't have any hair, so it's a very, very intimate experience that we are offering at the low, low price of $4,000. And you can join our Discord. That is for free. And it is, get, does give you a chance to speak to the one and only Matthew Spawn Hour. Link to that is at the link tree across our social media bios. So with that, as always, appreciate you guys. I have been Carson Braver. I have been Logan Camden. And this was Nerd Sash. Nerd Sash.